This week in virology, episode number 149, recorded September 17th, 2011. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Today, we're broadcasting from the 51st Conf the International Conference on Antimicrobial Agents in Chemotherapy, also known as ICAC and we're in Chicago, Illinois. And joining me today, from usually from North Central Florida, but today here in Chicago with me, Rich Condit. Hello, Vincent. How are you How doing? Are you? I'm doing great. This is good fun. How's the weather in Chicago? Uh, weather in Chicago, I, you know, it was cold last night. And that was, a, I was, I felt like insulted. That's um, because it was 85 where you came from, right. right? But I haven't been outside today, so I don't know. It looks like blue skies and looks windy. Like blue skies. Typical Chicago weather. Well, thanks for joining us. Appreciate uh, you coming all this way. Uh, to do, it's, it's a to ball. Do it. No problem. Also joining us today uh, on Rich's left, someone I've known for many years. He is the chief of the enterovirus section at the Center for Centers for Disease Control here in the United States. Mark Palanche. Welcome to TWIB. Thank you, Vincent. It's been. Uh, Great to have the invitation to come here and uh, look forward to it. Good. Look forward to talking to you today. Mark is talking at this meeting um, and that you're going to be talking about polio eradication. Right. right. So I thought we would explore that for you here in advance of uh, your talk. Okay. Also joining us on Mark's left, someone I've known for a few years as well. She is a health and medical writer at the Chicago Tribune, which is here in Chicago. Trina Suderos, welcome to TWIP. Thank you so much. I'm totally honored. I've been listening for years, and it's, it's a thrill to be here. We're happy to have you. I think I first met you during the swine flu outbreak in 2009. Right. You just emailed me a question, I think. Yep, I did. I was, I was supposed to cover it. I didn't know much about viruses, and I thought, maybe Vincent will know, and, and he was maybe. so helpful. <laughs> an and chance. he did. <laughs> so, and he was incredibly helpful. And, I've been bugging you ever since, I think. Pleasure so. <laughs> to do so. So we'll talk with you as well. But before we get started, we do have uh, an audience here. And uh, we're welcome. we welcome questions, of course, from the audience. And if any of you are listening on the live stream, we are streaming this uh, live. You can send a question at the live stream. There's a chat box there. Or you can send a question via Twitter. If you use Twitter, use the hashtag ICAC, I-C-A-A-C, -A -A with a pound sign in front of it, and we'll be able to get your questions. So Trina Suderos, first thing I would like to know is how do you have a Norwegian and Greek name together? Yes, yes, I am Greek and Norwegian. Um, well, my dad, uh, he's, he was born and raised in Greece, and my mom is, um, was born and raised in Norway, and they met in Boston and, uh, and stayed, and now we are, I'm the Norwegian Greek progeny of, there aren't that many of us Norwegian Greeks around. So, so. they decided to compromise on the name. Yeah, right. yeah, and the re result is it looks like two typos. Trina and Sideros look like typos. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible, <laughs> so, but I guess memorable. I think you grew up in Boston, right? Yeah, so yeah I'm from Boston, originally, outside of Boston. So um, tell us a little bit about your educational background and how you came to be uh, a health yeah. and medical writer. Well, um, I grew up in Boston with two sort of passions. Uh, one of them was to be a, I wanted to be a doctor, and I was one of those kids who um, sort of obsessively drew uh, anatomical drawings. I had Gray's Anatomy as a child, and I would actually copy all the things. So I was really obsessed with that. And I was also um, wanted to be a journalist. And so I, um, those two things sort of, Met up in college. I was uh, I took pre med classes and I also um, worked for the student magazine, but then I uh, chose one. I chose journalism, and uh, and so in 1995 I started off at um, the Wilson Daily Times, tiny little paper in Wilson, North Carolina, and uh, I was a health reporter there. Um, and then I, and I covered all kinds of things. Wilson, North Carolina had a lot of really uh, complicated health problems that were really interesting to write about. They had a rising TB rate when the rest of the country was 
for the most part, um, declining. They had lots of AIDS in, in rural, you know, rural North Carolina, which was uh, an air, kind of a topic that hadn't been written about very much about AIDS in rural um, communities. And so I wrote about that kind of thing. And then I went on to the Nashville, Tennessean, where I was writing about growth and planning, nothing to do with health at all. And uh, eventually I worked at People Magazine, of all things, sort of an aberration, and <laughs> covered people like Jennifer Lopez. And then finally I got to the Chicago Tribune, and, um, and two years ago I got uh, named the medical writer, which is sort of like what I had been aiming for the whole time. I had been, I, because of my two loves of sort of medicine and journalism, now I can do both. So it kind of saved me from going to medical school. I was considering dropping it all and going to medical school. So this is a much, um, this is a happy marriage of my two interests, I think. So your formal training in health science sort of ended at undergraduate, yeah. is that right? And well, for the most part, I actually took, after I graduated from college, I actually took for fun um, classes like or more organic chemistry and stuff. I was just sort of trying to keep that. You took organic chemistry for fun. I did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I found it fun. I don't know, you know, so I was sort of trying to keep that possibility of going to medical school alive in case I sort of decided the journalism thing wasn't going to work out. So I, um, I took those classes for fun. And then every time I was sort of ready to pull the trigger and just do the medical school thing, my job got really interesting again. And so I thought, well. Um, so I've always done this. And now, like I said, it's sort of my real dream job is what I have now. So, so if you were to do it again with the goal of being a science and medical writer, mm -hmm. is there anything you would do differently? Well, I mean, I guess, you know, it, you could say, well, it would be good to have a formal scientific training, like have a PhD and just, but, but even, or an MD. But um, really for this job, you cannot have some kind of specialized training that allows you to write about all science. I mean, even having, if you, even if I had sort of a neuroscience degree, um, I've read, you know, writing about viruses would not give me, that would not give me that much. I think it's the understanding of the scientific method and sort of the limitations of what, where, what I know is and how to go about learning um, from people like yourselves. That's kind of the, I think that's the key to this job. I don't think having real, real, you know, a degree would have, it would have helped me in some ways, but not really. You're saying that science is too focused to be <laughs> of use in journalistic ways? Yeah, I guess yeah. so. But I mean, we, we've had, my predecessor has a P. I, I got this job after my predecessor, Jeremy Manier, went to the University of Chicago, and he had a PhD, and and um, clearly it helped him. He wrote about a lot of things that were tied to what he had specifically studied. But my job is very broad. And I look, actually my, my sort of focus has been looking at um, sort of the evidence, what the evidence is for certain um, questions and then how it uh, sort of happens on the ground among patients mm -hmm. and physicians. And in that way, I, you know, a broader understanding is really useful. And if I had a really narrow one, it wouldn't. I don't think it would help. So I've read some of the stuff that you've written, and what strikes me is that you do seem to have a nose for the truth, OK? And I'm wondering, in particular, without a for formal science background training and with all of the truth and fiction that's out there in the popular press and mm -hmm. on the internet, how you manage to find the truth. Yeah, well, I should back up that. I. In college, I worked on an epidemiological project. I was, the, I was just a research assistant. I did the grunt work, the data entry. I drove this um, van that picked up samples of sexually transmitted disease, um, samples from Wilson, North Carolina, from where the study was um, based, and brought it back to the university. I did all this sort of grunt work. And I think when I was doing that, um, and I had a lot of contact with the PI, and, and I learned a lot about the limitations of doing science, that there are a lot of limitations to, there's a lot of problems with collecting data and a lot of um, weaknesses in, in studies. Not that this was a weak study, it was a great study that I was working on, but they, the scientists themselves knew this and I knew this. And, and so I think it made me very s skeptical when approaching evidence and studies, knowing that one study doesn't sort of establish an answer to a question. And so I think that has sort of informed all my all my stories that I know that that um, that one study doesn't 
doesn't sort of answer a question. It takes a whole lot of them. And so I think in that, that way, I don't think I have a good nose for the truth, because I don't think I go for it from sort of a gut instinct. I think it's more about looking with, at what the evidence is and then looking at what is actually happening in society and seeing how those pair up, you know. So that's. So you have real experience with the scientific method. Yes. And that has engendered in you skepticism. Yes. <laughs> Great. A lesson so, for everybody. Yeah. I mean, not that I don't think scientists do a bad job at all. That's not it. I think scientists, good scientists, know and acknowledge and sort of embrace the limitations in their studies, and that's. Um, but I think it's important for us journalists to know that too when we're writing about medicine. I, you know, the studies that I, the stories I really hate are the story of the day, study of the day stories where you have, you know, some study comes out and they write coffee will give you cancer or something. Those those stories are terrible, I think, and so I avoid writing them at all. I don't write those, and I think that. Um, because of sort of my back, background and just that experience I had in, in um, the epidemiological project, I think I approach it all a little bit differently. Than no, that. I, I meant skepticism in a very positive way. Yeah. I think the best science is done by skeptics. Yeah. Okay, you say, well, constantly you're saying, what if I'm wrong? Right, you know? right, right, right. And that's, I think, for journalism, it's the same thing. You, you really, I mean, I think journalists and, and scientists sort of have the same mission you know, to find the truth, whatever it is, and to approach it whatever you're approaching skeptically and always questioning. And that's what I try to do in my stories. I'm curious about how you, how you interact with <clears throat> scientists and people you need to talk to to get uh, the information for your studies. Mm -hmm. How do you pick them, for example? Oh, I try to pick, um, I try to find whoever is the best, the, the, the most qualified to answer the questions that I have. So, you know, I, I go through, um, I go looking on PubMed to see who's written about, uh, who's written studies, you know, who's, who's been the, sort of the primary author on studies, but also who might have written reviews of, um, the, like, mm -hmm. of the question, whatever question I'm looking at, to see who sort of the rest of the field considers to be the, the experts. And then I'd ask whoever I'm talking to, who else would you talk to? So I try to gather up a lot of people. And then I try to find people like yourself that help guide me through answering and find through the field. And so I tr I've been having a lot of luck finding sort of guides to each individual area who can help me figure out who the experts are in each part and what the big questions are. What questions have sort of been settled and which are not settled and, and which, you know, so that's how I sort of go So about do you ever it. come up against not understanding something and what do you do? How do you If I don't out? understand? Yeah. Oh, if I Someone's yeah, talking to you and they're explaining <laughs> an answer to your question, and you have no clue what they're talking about. Oh, I about. have no problem you telling them. them I, yeah, I mean, I think I, I'm, I mean, I'm not an expert I, in anything, but I think most everybody is not an expert in most things. So I have no problem <laughs> saying, you know, please go through that again and again and again. And actually, I, I go through, after I've written my stories, I always send it out to the people that are written in, you know, who are my sources, mm -hmm. to have them mm -hmm. fact check. And it's an extremely sort of laborious process, but it's brilliant, really, because, not, I'm not brilliant, but the process is good, because we, I have real experts looking it over, and often they find very subtle mistakes that are clear to a scientist that's an expert in that field, but that wouldn't be clear to a non-scientist. So you do, your own, you do your own peer review. Yes, is that, I try. Is that common? <laughs> no. No, I don't think, I think most journalists, there is like kind of an unwritten rule that you don't read back quotes or send back quotes to people because mm -hmm. you don't really want them meddling or fiddling or editing or, but I think in terms, when you're talking about science, it's almost like, send, like trying to write something in Chinese and then sending it to lay, or you know, to fluent speakers, native speakers and saying, do I have the grammar mm -hmm. right? Do I have, you know, that's, for me, science, almost is, is sort of akin to that. And so that's why I do it. Well, I hope so. there's a whole bunch of people listening to this. <laughs> well, okay, there's this hundreds, is, hundreds of you. Because <laughs> this, this is important stuff. That's yeah. great. You remember well, Alan Dove has told us that often there's no time for fact checking. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about that? No, there's, I mean, I would rather, I would rather spend that extra time doing that than the next day when it's in the paper and cannot be retracted to have it be a mistake that you have to write a clarification or a correction. I, I've, I haven't had a mistake in 
or a correction in years and years and years, nothing. And there are plenty of people who want to find them. You know, I, don't, I have a lot of people who don't really you know, enjoy my stories that much. And, and so there are lots of people looking with a fine tooth comb. I've never had a correction. Well, my experience with you is that you send me the whole story mm -hmm. usually. Yeah. And my experience with most other writers, they send me the one sentence of mine that they quote. Yeah. And that could be fine, but yeah. it could be in the wrong context. Right. Well, that's why I think it's important to see it in context sure. and have as many eyes on it. I don't send everybody the whole thing. I often will send, but I send the people that I think are sort of the native speakers, a lot of times giant chunks or the whole thing, just to, and it saves a lot of, I mean, I think you've caught mistakes in my stories before, before they go out, and I think it's natural, I, I think, and that's, it's a good process to go through. It helps fix problems before it's out there and, you know, you can't retract 300,000 copies of the paper, so. Well, I think it's good for scientists also to do this to mm -hmm. make sure things are correct. Yeah. And many are too busy to do it, unfortunately. It's a good exercise to yeah. go through, and it's all about improving communication. That's what we're trying to mm -hmm. do. So I would tell everyone, I feel like you know, most, most of the people I send it to are happy to yeah. do it. I don't find that, um, I never, no one's ever said no, so. So where do your stories come from? Exactly what I was yeah. going to ask. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, you know, the first, the first story I did um, sort of led to all the others. So the first story I did was on, I wanted to sort of establish when I first became the health medical science writer was um, sort of what my viewpoint was. And so I wrote about um, the coffee studies, all the, the coffee studies that show that it causes cancer, does not cause cancer. And I wanted to talk about how how, why this would be that you see a coffee study one day that says it prevents and then the one that says it causes. And, and I spoke to John Ioannidis then, he's at Tufts, and he writes a lot about false findings. And so uh, from there, with that perspective on, on studies and study of the day stuff, I decided I don't want to do that. And I, it sort of led me to alternative treatments for autism, and I wrote about those looking at the validity of the science behind alternative treatments for autism. And then I, that led me to stories about Dr. Oz. And so I think each one has sort of led me to the next. I haven't had any trouble finding stories since because they almost always bring up a question that I think, OK, I should look at this next. Um, one of the stories that, I, that sort of came organically and not through just another story I'd done um, was the XMRV story where I think when that the, um, the study came out in science in 2009, I think, or was it, 2000, <laughs> it was 2009, I think I contacted Vincent and said, what do you make of this? And he said, you should watch this for the whole year. You'll get a book out of it at the end. And I don't think either of us thought that it was going to turn out the way it was. I think it was the thought, maybe this will be the discovery of a new human infectious retrovirus. But I followed that, and it turned out to be a very different story. But um, that one was just sort of watching, kind of a watching with an eye. Actually, I, I had a lot of um, experience with alternative treatments for autism. And when I saw Judy Mikovits, who was the main researcher for that XMRV study, pop up at a, at a conference talking about um, it was an alternative treatments for autism conference, I sort of knew a lot about that conference. And I knew that they, that conference peddled a lot of dubious treatments and, and ideas. And it made me. Um, made me wonder and pay a little bit more attention. And that's where those stories came from. So, so. the XMRV is the connection between this retrovirus mm -hmm. and chronic fatigue syndrome. Right. So are you surprised at the way that story ended out? Yeah. I, I, it was like two worlds colliding, for me at least, because uh, it was the retroviral world that I was sort of interested in anyway, and then alternative treatments for autism and alternative treatments, that world colliding. I don't think when that study came out, I didn't think it was going to turn out the way it did, but it was very, very interesting how it did turn out. And, and for me, it was um, a look at, you know, the, it was a way to talk about the fact that one study, even produced in a, or published in a journal like Science with you know, reputable scientists can turn out to be wrong and, and how um, the whole thing can take off and take a different turn than we thought. So the, in this case, the, you know, very, um, it looked like a good study, but it turned out to be not, no one could replicate the findings. And then um, 
on the other side, you had patients and some scientists sort of pushing it along as if it were true, and, and uh, patients taking antiretroviral drugs based on almost nothing. And so I thought that was a way to look at that question, not, not only uh, replicating how important that is, but also how um, an alternative treatment movement can sort of take a life of its own. And, and so, yeah, it was interesting. So in the course of my career, I've seen journalism go from just physical newspapers and mm -hmm. letters to the editor to now where you have everything online and people can comment immediately. Yeah. So I don't, did you enter when there were just papers or were, are you in the online only? No, I was, I was back when it was just papers. Yeah, so 1995. So yeah. the fact that everything's online now encourages much more comment. And I know in a lot of your stories, yeah. there's a lot of discussion. Yeah. Um, so how do, how do you deal with that? I, you know, I, I have to say I despise comments. Uh, I think, <laughs> I have to say, truthfully, okay. you know, I think about my, the, the amount of work that goes into my stories, the, the, the enormous amount of fact checking and everything is true. And then in that same space below, Anybody anonymously can can say spew completely untrue uh, lies, fat, you know, just whatever, and and they they sound authoritative and they they compete with a story that is mine that's completely fact checked with the the thoughts and opinions and gathered wisdom of people with decades and decades of experience like yourself. So. To me, it's, it's allowing, it's giving the same space over to, to people who are just anonymous, who are just saying stuff that's you know, verifiably untrue. And I can't go in there, and I don't have time or the desire to go in and spend time sort of. I've tried it a couple times. It's completely you know, unsatisfying and pointless. So I, I, if I had my druthers, I would turn, you know, I, would, I don't like comments, but. Yeah, I'm not in control, so <laughs> you know, I suppose the other side is it's good to have people interacting and, and I you know, but I mean I know in your comments there they can get extremely heated, especially when it's uh, about XMRV and chronic fatigue syndrome. Yeah. It's very, very heated and and you know, you you people will be arguing with you and you know, who have no reason to argue with you, you know. Well, the people can argue with me, especially if there's a basis, but most of the time the arguments are unfounded. And right. my response is not to respond because you never can win any of those yeah. kinds of arguments. Right. My son told me the other day, I, I showed him a comment. He said, Dad, that's a troll. Just ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how do you know this, by I the way? I know. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but we're here, it's here to stay on blogs, yeah. in newspapers. And also, the journals have comment areas yeah. as well. And as you said, you can have a really well done study, and someone would say this is trash, right? And they have, may not have read it, and a lot of people will believe it. Yeah, that's the thing. So it just can. I, we had this uh, same conversation with Seth Manukin yeah. over uh, the panic virus and right. the, the notion of uh, credible science and baloney right. getting the same airtime. And right. what do you do about that? And actually, that's. Uh, uh, you raise important points because that's a significant problem with the current medium. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, I, we we sort of it's hard for people to sort out. It's very hard for people to sort out what's uh, what they should believe and what they shouldn't, and what's a real fact and what's just sort of a made up craziness. And if someone can be very authoritative sounding and sound very sciencey, a lot of times they can win over people, even though there's no reason at all to believe what they're saying, and they have no, they are wrong. Period. They're just wrong. And so, in you know, I, it pains me to see sort of a back and forth where people are are believing completely ridiculous stuff put up by an anonymous person, whereas you have you know a story that was done by myself where I have my name there and, and it's fact checked and it's and it's not me talking. It's not it's it's the collected, you know, words from people who really you should listen to, people who have been studying this for decades. And so I you know, I have my own I have very heated thoughts about it. But <laughs> So do you have any sense where this will end up, how it will be resolved or no clue? I was it's kind of chaos. I don't know. I don't know. I mean I guess really what will happen is that I think readers will Either learn to tune out, you know, comments in a way, or or learn to figure out what they should, be, you know, believe or not, or you know, kind of go along as it is now, and people will sort of seek out ideas, comments that sort of agree with themselves, and and ignore ones that don't. And I don't think that gets us anywhere at all. I mean, 
Maybe you can write about this, <laughs> how to think. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, well, I tr you know, I sort of try in my, in my stories, I, I hope that my stories are all, they're about something in particular, but they're also, each one is about a different aspect of how to understand science and medical right. science. And so I hope, you know, sort of if you read my stories, you know, you sort of gain more understanding about how to approach, how to, how to approach medical studies and how to, um, you know, how the scientific method works and how scientists work and, and what's um, junk science and what's good science and, and what, you know, so I'm hoping that that's probably one of the most important things you can do. Yeah. Is is educate people on how to on how to discriminate. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's I, so I hope you know because there's a lot of noise out there. It's sort of a lot of bad information on the internet competing with good information, and it's very difficult, I think, sometimes to tell which is which. You know, and and it's very easy to sort of fall into a trap of of um, listening to to sites that seem to verify what you believe or what your gut tells you, whereas really what you should be doing is finding credible sources that, that um, are offering you facts and what's you know, the closest approximation to the truth, not just what feels right or feels you know, good to you. In your, in your current job, are you free to, I mean, are you on your own, mm -hmm. write anything you want? You Pretty must much. have deadlines at least, or do you? Not, not um, yeah, yes. Yes and no. I mean, I, I have, I'm as free to write whatever I want as I could be, although it's not like I can just write, go work on a story for months and months and months, not tell my editor what I'm doing, and then just, they'll just slip it into the paper. You know, so there is a certain amount of me pitching ideas. <laughs> that would be lovely, but me pitching ideas to my editors, and then they sort of pick what they're interested in, and then I work on it, and then a certain amount of time goes by, and you know, it's you know time to get the story in the paper, and then we push so it. So there's a give and take, but you really drive the. Thing, yeah, right? okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never been. I mean, with the swine flu story, you know, that came up. They asked me to write about that. That sometimes happens, but generally, I'm I'm coming up with my own ideas and and pitching them and and shaping them, and then um, working with the editors to make sure you know we work together to turn it into uh, you know a package of. Greatness, right? <laughs> so, is there anything you're working on now that you can tell us about? Oh, I, I can't talk about. No, I can't talk about it right now because it's 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 an, it's a pro <laughs> investigative project, and I don't want to give it away. But it's um, I'm following up on. Yeah, I'm still following the XMRV story. I'm waiting for the um, blood working group to come out with their uh, their results. I think that's supposed to happen really soon, and. Um, and then I'm following, I, I um, wrote about this doctor and his son, Mark Geyer, and his son, David Geyer. They had um, been peddling a really a controversial treatment for autism involving giving kids um, a chemical castration drug for autism. And they've been losing their, uh, Mark Geyer's been losing his medical license around the country bit by bit, um, in part because of my stories. And so I've been following that along. And so he's lost, I think, his lessons in five states so far. So, so I've been following along sort of the, um, the fallout from some of my stories. Mm -hmm. But my new ones, I can't talk about. OK. <laughs> so uh, what's in your future? Are you going to do this for the rest of your career? Is there something else you might do? Um, I would like to do it for the rest of my career. I, I hope that news, you know, newspapers continue to survive. Will and, they? And, you know, you, <laughs> so you as long as that lasts, I would love to. I would love so to. So what do you think about newspapers surviving? What's going to happen? Well, you you, you want to think that um, that that there'll always be a place for journalists to to do our job, and and you know, so you hope for that. But it's a tough time for newspapers. Our paper is our company is in bankruptcy, and uh, and you know and we've been we've done a lot of sort of reshuffling of the paper and and what we're doing. We've put a lot of resources into investigative reporting, which is sort of what I'm sort of my job is sort of in that um, ball and and uh, and so you know I hope that that we're doing we're sort of headed down the right path, but. You know, this, it's tough. It's a really tough time, and there's no there's no law that says there has to be paid journalists. Sure. There just isn't. So maybe you should write a book. <laughs> yeah. Well, 
I, I was. Th I've thought about it. Yeah. I think the XMRV CFS story. Yeah. Maybe combined with um, the the Lyme disease yeah. Yeah, story, yeah. which we've written about. They have a lot of themes in common. It's true. It's true. It's, it's actually like they have overlapped. The Lyme disease folks have sort of um, decided that XMRV is involved in their problems as well. So yeah. Yeah. Well, if you do write it, I'll be happy to check it for you. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Anything else from you, Rich? Sure. We can move on. Thanks so much. Pleasure. Do do feel free to grill. Oh yeah. Dr. <laughs> have you ever interviewed him at all? You've never spoken. No, him no, I have not. It's your first. Now you have another name in your Rolodex. Yes. Rolodex. Actually, I would like to know mm. how you found Vincent. It was on the X. It was on the H1N1. Is this blog or uh, PubMed or what? I think. Think. Or what? I think how did I find him? Uh, maybe someone else gave me your name. I think maybe someone else that I had interviewed said, why don't you call Vincent Racaniello? And then I emailed you. Mm -hmm. And you were so helpful that I latched on. <laughs> <laughs> you don't find, you know, some, you've, you've, as a journalist, you really value your, the folks that you find that are beyond just beyond the the regular helpful sure I'll talk to you but are actually like happy to sort of teach you I felt like I've learned a lot about how science works from Vincent so we had an interesting experience with XMRV that I won't review yeah but it's it's in the did I document it somewhere yes I wrote a post and I spoke with you actually yeah, I spoke yeah. with you and I made a statement and right. I decided I, it was wrong so uh, I wrote a blog post and basically retracted a statement yeah, I yep, made to you. Yep. Um, and I think it's important to admit your mistakes right away as well. So. Well, one thing about that that I really appreciated was that you didn't throw me under the bus. Like, that it could have been easy to say, well, I didn't say that. But you, you really didn't. And it was like this, I thought I was, I was very, I was very impressed and happy that you, that you didn't. Okay. No, uh, I wouldn't throw anybody under the no, bus. No, I know you wouldn't, but. <laughs> Before we we journalists, on, we get thrown under the bus occasionally. Of so. course. <laughs> Before we go on to speak with Mark, to, a sponsor of today's episode is Wiley Blackwell, the leading scientific publisher of books, scholar, scholarly journals, major reference works, and databases. This month, which is September, they're offering 25% off all microbiology and virology books. And if you'd like to take advantage of that offer, go to their website, which is wiley.com slash go slash microbe world. That's wiley.com slash go slash microbe world. If you're a Facebook user, go to their fan page at facebook.com slash microbiology news. And they have quite a nice selection of microbiology and virology books. For example, here's one studies in viral ecology, microbial uh, ecology. Uh, if you're into genetics, molecular genetics of bacteria, bacterial virulence, quite a nice selection of, of books on the topic, and they're 25% off today. So we thank Wiley Blackwell for their support of this week in virology. It looks like we have a question. Uh, yeah, uh, I know we've been talking about science journalism, but we have a, so we have, a, I guess, a bit of a non sequitur of a <laughs> virology question from a Twitter user, Don Kyle. Uh, and he wants to know, what do you think will be the most significant viral risk for future pandemics? And will it be zoonotic in origin? He's uh, mm -hmm. seen contagion. Right? <laughs> <laughs> he may have, yes. Yeah. What was the name of the virus in that movie? That That's was it. A, uh, Mev or something? I, I haven't know. seen it yet. <laughs> so I have to wait. What is the most significant risk? I don't know. Do you, do you know? Maybe Mark would know. Mark, on. come on, Mark, what's the answer? I left the crystal ball at home. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you know, zoonotic sources certainly uh, are an issue and uh, come up in NEPA and uh, SARS, and uh, there are certainly examples. Um, but it is also very clear that predicting is uh, not uh, very accurate uh, in most of these situations. I think. Uh, that you can certainly highlight based upon experience, but that won't necessarily confine the possibilities in the future. Yeah, predicting is hard, especially of the future. <laughs> okay, so Mark, 
tell us about your background. Where did you come from? Um, well, born in Minnesota, but grew up outside the D.C. area. Uh, my father was a biochemist uh, mm. and worked for the government. And so I was determined not to be a biochemist and not to work for the government. <laughs> um, so uh, I ended up uh, looking at uh, my first love, which was physics. And at that period of time when I was thinking of college, uh, there was a sizable proportion of physicists driving taxis. Uh, so <laughs> decided that it probably should have a more flexible plan. So uh, starting in undergraduate, I actually discovered, of course, biochemistry is a fascinating field, and ended up getting my undergraduate degree in biochemistry and uh, where at was, uh, where Virgi does, where Virginia was Tech. Okay. And one of the deciding factors there was that they actually had a biochemistry department back when it was mostly an interdisciplinary mm -hmm. study in a lot of schools. Um, then I went to graduate school at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, ended up applying there because, of course, the application was free. <laughs> and so my advisor convinced me that it was a good idea just to apply. Uh, he had happened to go there, so he thought highly of the school. But it was free, so I said, what the heck? Um, and that was actually uh, the transition from what was the worst course that I took as an undergraduate uh, virology <laughs> to actually starting working on viruses as a graduate student. And at that time started working on polio and uh, sort of caught uh, a lot of interest because of course of the inherent complexity of the virus in a very small package. Whose lab was that in? That was Roland Rickert's laboratory. Um, so I studied the processing, the protein processing of uh, polio at that time. Um, so I decided, well, these acute infections are you know, one example of how viruses work. So then I thought about, you know, I'd really like to study something with more of a chronic uh, infection link. Uh, so uh, actually went to New York uh, about the same time you were arriving in New York. Uh, and. Uh, started studying chronic measles infection with uh, Pernell Chopin at the Rockefeller. Um, so that was my postdoctoral work. And uh, uh, I had a colleague from Wisconsin, uh, who you also know, Olin Q, who had gone to CDC um, about five years earlier uh, and uh, had been working on polio there as well. And he calls me up one day and says, there's an opening, uh, and it's to run a diagnostic lab. Uh, are you interested? And so I told him, thank you for thinking about me, but uh, you know, no thank you. And so several months later, he calls back again and says that, well, there's now flexibility in the job. At least come down and talk. And so uh, that basically was the beginning of uh, getting hooked into the interface between basic research science and its applied applications in public health. And uh, the rest is history. So mm -hmm. I've been at CDC now for 27 years. Uh, so does or did your father get to see you become a biochemist working for the government? <laughs> he indeed did. He reminded me of what I had said early in my life about how I was not going to do that. So yes, he indeed did follow through, as he did with most things like that. So I, I introduced you as chief of the enterovirus section, but now you have a, bit, a higher title, right? Well, so as of uh, nearly six months ago, um, so the the only uh, boss I had at CDC for all these years uh, finally decided that he really wanted to retire. Mm -hmm. And so there became an opportunity to do something different. And mm -hmm. so I, uh, six months ago, uh, was appointed to the director of the Division of Viral Diseases. And so I've almost survived six months. Mm -hmm. So that's a big responsibility. What, can you describe that responsibility, or is it, do we not have enough time? Well. <laughs> So, it, it, I mean, it's a much broader mandate, uh, and, at, uh, and it is a division that has a very diverse collection of viruses, if you want to approach it from the virologic perspective. 
So there are the picornaviruses, particularly polio. Um, there are the uh, paramyxoviruses, uh, adenoviruses, other respiratory viruses uh, that are also studied, like some of the new viruses, the Boca virus. Um, so metanumovirus, another example. Uh, some of the agents of gastroenteritis, uh, rotaviruses, noroviruses, uh, measles, mumps, rubella, uh, herpes, uh, except for herpes one and two. So more the CMV, the varicella. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's also related to research, diagnostics, and uh, the domestic uh, vaccine, uh, viral vaccine preventable diseases. So did you spend most of your career at CDC on enteroviruses and polio in particular? Was so I started with a very clean mandate to work only on uh, the enteroviruses, mm -hmm. not polio. <laughs> and so that lasted for probably six months. And it was exactly coinciding with the time that uh, the Pan American Health Organization started their eradication efforts in the Americas. So what year are we talking about now? So this was 1985 when I started to work on polio at CDC. Okay. So it, uh, the, the program in the Americas had started uh, basically about a year uh, earlier uh, with, uh, of course, major efforts in Brazil. And what, yeah, what comes to mind is the uh, uh, Brazilian uh, National Immunization Days, is, is that right? Correct. Is that their invention? So in many ways, yes, although to, to give credit, it was actually a core component of what uh, Albert Sabin advocated from the very beginning, that the vaccine should be delivered in campaigns. And so in the early days, of course, that's what we had Saban Sundays uh, to do exactly that. And it basically brought the immunity level of the population up simultaneously in large uh, numbers of children. I lined up in the gym and took my sugar cubes. Yeah, well, and of course, now we know that the sugar cubes partially inactivated the virus, but it, it sure tasted better. <laughs> So three years later, in 1988, I think, the WHO announced its plan to eradicate polio. Did you become involved with that immediately or not till later? So yes. Uh, I mean, the consequence was, of course, then it became a global program. Right. And all of the efforts that uh, Olin and I had been involved with in the American region with the laboratories then needed a global scope. So he and I went to uh, Geneva and spent three, works, three weeks drafting uh, the global action plan for the creation mm -hmm. of the network. And that has remained to this day the template for how these uh, laboratories were set up and managed and coordinated. So um, that started almost immediately at that point to then be a true global involvement. And the regions took it on in different mm -hmm. order. So the Western Pacific region uh, started very soon, uh, and of course the European region. So those, of course, were the next two regions to be certified polio-free. So what was your role in, in this campaign, or CDC's role? Yeah, so I mean, CDC started in terms of providing the technical expertise and the epidemiology uh, and the laboratory. And those are two traditional roles that we had had. Uh, as the scope of the program changed, of course, there were a lot more operational issues uh, that became paramount to uh, achieving success. And so a lot more effort was put into the areas of operational research. Uh, and of course, this is uh, the nature of the program is that CDC is only one of the partners and it's mainly coordinated through the World Health Organization. Uh, Rotary International has been part of this, uh, the partnership uh, from the very beginning. Uh, UNICEF, of course, is very integrally involved with a lot of uh, uh, the vaccine supply issues as well as the local mobilization. So, uh, and more recently, the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have become a key partner, of course, in the effort. So the scale of things progressed quite rapidly from the purely technical uh, components mm -hmm. to thinking about more things that are operational and then ultimately, of course, trying to deal with the global policy questions.
I think this required a lot of travel on your part, right? Uh, yes, I have a lot of frequent flyer miles uh, <laughs> built up over the years, uh, which I still haven't had time to actually use. So uh, they're sitting there banked for now. <laughs> so how would you characterize the, the current state of, of the eradication campaign? So again, we're at a stage where we have, of course, some good news, uh, like India, which has not had a case of polio for eight months now, which is unprecedented uh, for that country. So that's, that actually is giving uh, some optimism, because that was considered to be the most difficult place remaining from the technical point of view. Um, the, then you look at some of the other places, where um, there's some good news and then there's some that certainly is, uh, looks like very difficult challenges remaining. And that's what I'll be talking about on Monday. But there are issues in Pakistan because the areas of the country that everybody reads about are exactly the areas where polio remains. Mm -hmm. um, Nigeria, it's the same situation where polio remains in the northern part of the country. Um, these foci of the remaining circulation are then the seeds for exporting virus. So for example, the type three polio uh, was exported from Nigeria to multiple countries in West Africa this year. Uh, from the eastern part of Nigeria, it's gone to Chad, and Chad has now been unable to stop that importation for quite some time. In the same time, you have just very recently, starting in July, uh, importation from uh, Pakistan to China. Um, so those are the kinds of things that highlight the risks uh, of not wiping out polio in the remaining reservoirs, because they can certainly mm -hmm. trigger outbreaks, widespread outbreaks. So these seed areas are basically areas of social and political upheaval that disrupt an immunization effort, is that correct? The remaining ones are largely in that category. Um, I mean, Northern India was more of you know, access to health care for uh, populations that are underserved chronically. So that seems to have been overcome by the actions of commitments from the government to address those problems. So can, uh, have you seen uh, very definite developments in northern India that, you, that, that could serve as a cause for this apparent disappearance, or at least short-term disappearance? Yes. No, I mean, there's been several factors, uh, including recognition of areas like the Kosi River in uh, Bihar state, where the populations are basically in a floodplain, and so they're almost inaccessible because there's no roads. So it's very difficult to even get in there to immunize children. And it turns out that once this was recognized, they set up mobile huts, basically, as mobile health care facilities. So to what extent do you draw on the experience from the smallpox eradication campaign in the cold? Because I'm hearing some common themes here, surveillance and, mm -hmm. and immunization. Yeah, no, there are clearly some similarities and some key differences. Uh, smallpox, of course, there was less uh, need for laboratories because the cases were clinically apparent. With polio, of course, you have a very low paralysis to infection ratio. Therefore, most children who have polio infection show no symptoms. So the only way that you can tell that a child is truly paralyzed by polio is because of the laboratory part of surveillance. So that's a key difference. Uh, that ends up having major operational issues. So it, it does have some similarities, some differences. Uh, ring vaccination, for example, does not work particularly well with polio. Uh, That's where you identify a seed case and try vaccinate to all around, around them. that case, right. Because you know you won't be missing that many clinically mm -hmm. in smallpox. We heard for many years that in India the problem was they needed five, 10 mm -hmm. immunizations, and now suddenly the problem has been solved. So what happened there? Well, so two things happened. One is, of course, the number of doses increased mm -hmm. further so that there were literally almost 10 immunizations mm -hmm. per year for each of these children. So by the time they were five years old, they'd had dozens of uh, vaccinations. 
And, but I think that that probably is one of these things uh, uh, that you can look at from the point of view of the data versus how it is being interpreted. Um, in terms of identifying the true critical factors that are limiting success. Um, so I think we will probably never completely know mm -hmm. which of the factors was the most important. It was clearly multiple factors that were all addressed simultaneously. So do you still give 10 doses to? So you know? this is gonna be the question that will come up as a policy decision for the government of India is wow. when do you change the frequency with which you're giving immunizations, if you think you're done, but the risk being you might be wrong. 10 is huge. It's right. a logistic nightmare, right? It is, I mean, it's a, it, but it is pulled off in the sense mm -hmm. that it does work. So there is an entire infrastructure that has been built to do that. Okay. I think the bigger issue is, of course, is the uh, how to represent that as a commitment of you know, the government to its health problems. And that's why there will be pressure to say that we're done so they can move on with their resources yeah. to do other things. And I, it should be highlighted, though, that India's program was done with India's resources. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the few major reservoirs that have really tackled the problem themselves without having large amounts of external support. Are there any areas that you, of the world that you're not really sure what's going on, that surveillance isn't very good or very? So there, yes. I mean, that is, that is a constant challenge and has been for you know, nearly the beginning of the program. Uh, because the quality of our surveillance activities varies tremendously. Um, in early times, there were uh, difficulties even getting laboratories to be able to perform well in all parts of the world. Um, there were problems with being able to get people to report cases and then investigate cases, and you have this requirement of collecting specimens. Mm -hmm. So each of those parts of surveillance can cause a problem on their own. Um, so in aggregate, then you do have places where they coincide as all being problems. And so Africa has still remained as the major challenge in a large geographic area sense. And now we're dealing with much smaller uh, focal areas of concern. And the nature of surveillance is, of course, if you can still keep looking, time is also on your side. So reporting negative results over a longer period of time is better than over short. Right. So, you know, India with eight months of no polio is still way too short a period of time to go out and celebrate. And in places in Africa, there are places where two years will be too short. Mm -hmm. And so it, it will be part of the assessment of are we done? Right. And each of the regions goes through that process and have commissions that, again, look at the data um, and then decide if it is satisfactory. Um, so there is a complete assessment of that data. And it's directly related to also how well they immunize children. Mm -hmm. Places that immunize children well, you have less concern. Right. right. So it, it, it is linked in all of those aspects. What happened in China, there was, as you mentioned, is a recent outbreak. What, do we understand why? So, no, that's being investigated now, and there's a team on the ground. We just had a conference call uh, yesterday uh, getting updates. Um, I think that you know, the, there is concern, of course, this is in uh, Qingzhou province in the west. Um, this is also you know, coincides with the areas where there has been unrest uh, in the Uyghur minority. Uh, so I think that uh, in the end, the data at this point doesn't highlight something, you know, systemic uh, because the coverage levels look reasonably good. But the cases are showing up exactly on the road that if you go back, goes into uh, the neighboring countries from Pakistan up through uh, uh, Tajikistan. So and are the cases, is this wild type polio? This is wild type polio, and it links back specifically to viruses uh, that are being picked up still in Pakistan. Um, it, uh, there are some of these things. There was a case in the north of Pakistan earlier in the year 
And of course, the thinking was, is, well, that was proximally, it was the closest virus. Uh, but it wasn't that virus at all. It was one that was actually in from the south of the country. Hmm. So the movement of polio is quite unpredictable uh, as some of the examples I alluded to, but there have been three importations from India to Angola. And that's not an obvious connection. So there must be, or, or are there efforts either in the US or globally to monitor the prevalence of wild type polio outside of the incidence of disease? I mean, can this be done by looking at sewage or, right. or whatever? So, it, so the virus can readily be detected in sewage if the site is reasonably appropriate in that it concentrates uh, the sewage from multi, you know, a large enough population. So there's active uh, sewage surveillance that's been in place in India, for example, in Mumbai for nearly a decade. Um, this is now being expanded to other cities in India. It has just been expanded to northern Nigeria. And uh, that, that is an issue that is part of thinking about surveillance going forward from now. Do you continue to expand that to other risk areas? Um, and, but there are clear examples. For example, wild type virus from Chad was picked up in the sewage that comes from the airport in Geneva. Oops. Huh. But no cases, of course. Right. So addressing your point right. of being able to find virus in the absence of cases. So how do you decide when you're done, and then what do you do? So, yes. <laughs> So the, the, there are sort of benchmarks for when you're done. And again, that's an observation, of, you know, it's a negative observation over a period of time. But you have to do it in the non-trivial way, as of course, if you don't look, then you obviously get a negative observation. Uh, or if you look under the light post, you get a negative, then it doesn't tell you in things that you can extrapolate. So it has to be comprehensive, high quality surveillance over a period of time to provide the data. And at some point, you're prob it's probabilistic. It's like, what are your chances that you've missed it for that long? And so that is what the commissions basically are looking at. And there's all sorts of modeling that you can do to help guide the time frames. But it's, it's in general, it's years. So even when, if tomorrow we say this is the last case, you know, it'll be six months from now before we say, has anybody seen anything recently? But then looking further and it's saying, okay, where could we miss it? And then going in those areas and doing something extra to look for it. In the meantime, you can't be complacent. You have to, exactly. have, you have to be rigorous about the vaccine campaigns continuing. Correct, and, and, that's, and also you have to be continually prepared to respond. Mm -hmm. So the response strategies in terms of, okay, you go for 16 months and then you find a virus. You have to be able to move almost immediately. So do we have the resolve to do this for five, 10 more years? So it's, it, it, that planning is currently ongoing as we speak. Um, and there is a plan that is a five-year plan, which includes trying to figure out the resources necessary to keep doing that. And of course, the immunization part is the key because that's a large cost driver. So everybody accepts the fact that surveillance will stay the same or go up, but the amount of vaccination is really an issue, particularly as it relates to some of the longer term strategies of transitioning from live uh, oral polio vaccine to the inactivated uh, mm -hmm. killed vaccine. And the cost difference is key to seeing how much IPV uh, it can be used uh, for the same money. Um, but at the same time, that's a whole area of research. So that area of research is certainly ongoing, looking at ways to make IPV more affordable for the world. But at what point do you go from the Sabin to IPV? So that, this is part of the, you know, when, so if you can assure high coverage, then you do what countries are doing already. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, what we've seen is, of course, the developed countries are basically all switched or will be very soon. So I think we better make it clear why this is an issue. 
So the, the main risk going forward when the indigenous wild virus is eliminated is the risk that the vaccine, the live vaccine itself, can revert and in instances, probably we have one or two instances a year over the recent past, will circulate. So they will regain the ability to, to transmit from person to person in a sustained way. And of course, we've invented a very awkward name for this, uh, vaccine-derived polioviruses, or VDPVs. And so if you practice that a lot, you can say it very quickly. <laughs> So is it seen then as a necessary step in the eradication that there's going to be a, a transitional period where we move from the live attenuated virus, OPV, to the inactivated virus, IPV? Yes. So what you're the, again, when the wild virus is gone, you have the concern that you're on the surveillance side to make sure it goes away and you can detect any event that is unanticipated, including accidental release from a laboratory. You then have a period when you're only using the vaccine virus, but you will still have these occasional VDPV outbreaks. You know, the only way to get rid of those is to stop using the live virus um, in the short term. So, but in order to have population immunity, you have to have a replacement for the immunity that's currently being generated by the live vaccine. And that's where IPV comes in. The major concerns, of course, are trying to get the coverage of IPV up to a level where it actually has a real uh, effect on transmission. And that's an economic issue, among other things, right? It is economics, but the science is also uncertain because when you look at immunity, people mostly think about immunity to disease. But in the case of polio, because it's an enteric virus, you don't have sterilizing immunity to reinfection. So even if you have no possibility of getting the disease, you can be reinfected and participate in the transmission. <laughs> Oral polio vaccine is very effective at blocking that transmission. IPV alone there is discussion about the, the effect it has on enteric replication and the other route of spread for polio, which is upper respiratory. So again, the components of how much respiratory spread of polio there is versus fecal oral spread is a big unknown in most developing countries. So we don't know really whether IPV could interrupt transmission to the point where the whatever is circulating disappears? We don't know the relative effectiveness of okay. IPV compared to OPV. And that's okay. why studies are being planned and being done right now, again, to get data to help inform policy decisions. Okay. What's the role of antivirals in the end, end game? So th there is one group, another type of VDPV, which occurs in uh, individuals basically with uh, B cell immunodeficiencies. So they, have the, they are not able to make antibodies or effective antibodies against polio. Um, they, they do, on occasion, become chronically infected with polio. And in certain classes of these patients, the infection can go on probably for decades. Mm -hmm. They are not responsive to any other treatment. So in order to not have some individuals around who are excreting virus, yeah. which certainly virologists believe has every bit of potential to be like a wild virus, um, you have to have an intervention strategy to stop that infection. Not only that, it is beneficial to the patient because those individuals are at very high risk for paralytic disease yeah. And as uh, seen with the case here in the United States two years ago in Minnesota, led to death, even 16 years after probably being exposed. How many of these individuals are there globally that are shedding virus for long periods? Do we right. Know? So this is so there is a table which is being kept, which is both historical and mm -hmm. an attempt to keep it current. And the number of individuals is actually quite small. Um, so whether it's three or four today is, uh, is, is more or less the, the question. 
The real problem is, of course, is that there's no systematic screening. And without an intervention, there is an ethical issue of screening individuals for something you can't do anything about. Wow. And so that's going to be an issue is if there were an antiviral, it would be much easier to say, we have an intervention, we want to screen in order to reduce your risk of par paralysis mm -hmm. yeah. from this infection you don't even know you have. Can't we build it into the microbiome, the gut microbiome screening that is ongoing? Just say, what's the flora in the intestine? Maybe one of them is so, polio. Well, I mean, of course, some of that's already, as you yeah. know, well underway, and they, of course, have not found polio. So that's all, a little reassuring also. Yeah. That hasn't been detected just in these very limited studies, though. Mm -hmm. And the problem being is we're still thinking globally because some of these individuals have now been documented in countries which are in the middle income level. And so it makes the scope of the problem much larger. And so even in India, there have been a couple of yeah. these uh, individuals identified. It was previously thought to be only in developed countries, high yes. income, yeah. Wow, this is an amazing story, isn't it? It is an amazing story. And it's story. so complicated. And, you know, we're, spo we're spoiled by smallpox. Right. Yeah. That was the low-hanging <laughs> fruit. That's because you know? it worked so yeah. well. Yeah. Right. But um, I think it's going to be very tough going no, forward. No, I think that's, that's recognized. Uh, and again, but not necessarily for all of the obvious reasons that we think of as scientists. Mm -hmm. Because, again, it's the practice of science from, again, taking the things that we're using now were the tools developed yeah. in the basic research. We're applying them to a public health uh, problem. But in the end, public health, in its very broad sense, has, of course, many political aspects. Sounds like you're going to spend the rest of your career on this problem. Uh, <laughs> yes, in different ways. <laughs> and then you'll write a book. But then, the but, end, yes, <laughs> but then there's always measles. So. <laughs> So that's, uh, again, there are only a handful of these uh, infectious agents where humans are the only hosts, hmm. and that therefore there is the potential. Right. And uh, measles has the advantage of a more effective vaccine. Well, that'll be a subject of another podcast. Yep. Do, those, do those people that are sort of the chronic, uh, have the chronic infection and are shedding the virus, do they know this? So in the case of the woman in Minnesota, the answer was no. No completely unaware, and in the United States, of course, we have stopped using OPV mm -hmm. now more than 10 years ago. So we probably won't have new cases, but the ones can last for decades, right. uh, and that's really the, the question. How many more are there? Yeah, how, how do you read into the fact that there hasn't been you know, more cases sort of popping up here and there in the United States? And I, I think, well, there's, the fact that treatment for these individuals is very good in the United States. Mm -hmm. They actually require administration of immune globulin on a monthly basis. Mm -hmm. So they are more able to keep adequate treatment to suppress the polio. Right. But the only way we find out is if they become sick. Right. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Let's read a few emails from our listeners. The first one is from John, who writes, Concerning the letter you got about a Spanish version of TWIV, you remember that? Yep. Someone asked us <laughs> if he could do a Spanish version. <laughs> ASM already has a nice Spanish microbiology podcast called Mundos de los Microbios. Your TWIM co-host, Elio, has been on this podcast at least once. Perhaps you could put the would-be Spanish TWIV guy in touch with that podcast's host, Gary Taranzos, or with Elio. I'd love a virology podcast in Spanish, even though I wouldn't be able to listen at 2x speed like I do with the English language ones. <laughs> well, John, we'll put you in touch. I think we just did. We just did. <laughs> All right, the next one is from Jeffrey, who wrote this email in response to a discussion we had on episode 146. And on that episode, we received a letter from David who is a professor at Vassar. Vassar. And he wanted to know if we had any thoughts on the origins of the mythology of zombies and vampires <laughs> based this, on behavior this modifying. Twiz. 
twiz? This week in zombies. <laughs> Wanted to know if virus infections could cause zombieism. <clears throat> so Jeffrey writes, just to let you know that my own literary research suggests that the several forms of historical real life zombieism are probably due to chemical rather than viral factors. <laughs> if I ever finish it, it will be covered as a chapter in a book I am writing on shamanism and shamanic, shamanic drugs. Although much of the Caribbean zombie effect has been assigned to tet tetradotoxin, I believe that the effects of some of the other components have been underestimated. Now that's a toxin from puffer fish, right? Right. Okay. Well, uh, Caribbean zombies have become well known, if not accurately portrayed through the movies. It is less well known that Europe has its own zombie hordes. Greek <laughs> literature speaks of lycanthropes, which were far more like zombies than werewolves. And the Norse legends speak of living ghosts, Draugr, I believe, of great warriors as well as housewives. <laughs> Most of the European zombie stories speak of pathetic, weak creatures. A few legends, especially the Norse ones, speak of killing machines eventually dispatched by living warriors. All of the legends describe these zombies as mentally deranged. Interestingly, I believe that a few recovered their mental facilities and returned to life. Skipping over a lot of the background, it seems likely that these <laughs> living dead of Europe and the Americas were the result of accidental and deliberate overdoses of Jekyll tropes, tropane-containing herbal concoctions derived from members of the Solanum family, especially <laughs> the tourists. These Jekyll tropes seem to have included the zombie poison of Haiti and the witch's flying ointment of Europe, the effects of which can cause long-term derangement and suggestibility. Thus, real-life zombieism is of chemical etiology. A viral etiology is possible, but not, to, to the best of my knowledge, been observed. <laughs> wow. it's wow. a lot of stuff I didn't uh, know. Yeah, Sounds like a good book. <laughs> you know anything about chemical zombieism? No. <laughs> I mean, what does this guy do for a living? Uh, uh, look. He's writing a book about zombieism. Uh, interesting that he's a TWIV listener. <laughs> so I looked up uh, Jekyll Tropes, and uh, it, it, interestingly, it is the sparsest Google hit that, that, uh, <laughs> that I have tried. You know, it got like two hits in Google. That nowadays oh is gosh. nearly impossible. Wow. But I did look up uh, Datura, and... Um, uh, it looks like no fun at all. <laughs> a potent com combination of anti-collagenergic, uh, anti-collagenergic, cholinergic. Col thank you. <laughs> Substances um, it contains uh, produces effects similar to that of. Well, it produces delirium, as in contrast to hallucination. Inability to differentiate reality from fan fantasy, hyperthermia, tachycardia, bizarre, possibly violent behavior. Sounds like a typical day for me. <laughs> yeah. But um, it sounds like uh, no fun at all and typically could show up as zombies. I think the connection here is that one of the, in our discussion about viruses are live or dead, mm -hmm. uh, the best description, best response to that I've heard is that they are undead. <laughs> so viruses are zombies. You're yeah. Saying. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, the next one is from Robert, who says, Love, Twip, Twim, and Twiv. Found these through Futures in Biotech. Great explanations and not dumbed down for those of us with at least two brain cells. <laughs> Find everyone able to communicate this field very well. Learning lots, thanks lots. De Pommier is outstanding. Keep them coming. Can you speak about surface layers of viruses and how antibodies bind to this surface? This is a topic for an yep. episode in its own, right? Right. We will, Robert, thank you. Next one is from Natalie. I am a newcomer to your podcast and just want to start by saying how much I've been enjoying them. I learn a lot from each podcast and look forward to listening to them each week. A special thanks to Matt Evans for urging me to listen. One of the best things about the podcast is the way you can explain things to the general audience. For example, I loved Vince's definition of microfluidics on TWIV 142, really tiny tubes, small amounts of fluid. I wanted to draw your attention to another remarkable microfluidics paper recently published in Nature Medicine entitled Microfluidics-Based Diagnostics of Infectious Diseases in the Developing World. These authors are able to detect HIV and syphilis with just one microliter of blood with their M-chip assay. It is really exciting to think that this low-cost rapid assay could be used particularly in the developing world. 
All the best and keep up the good work. P.S. I'm currently an MD PhD student in Peter Palazzi's lab. Vince, I just learned you did your PhD with Peter. I hope you have some good stories you could one day share on, <laughs> on or off the air. I certainly do. Just need Definitely. prodding. Do you know anything about these microfluidic diagnostics? No, uh, yes. I mean, we're actually looking at them for exactly the same yeah. reason. There's a lot of funding going into trying to bring diagnostics into the developing countries for a lot of these disease problems. Um, for certain diseases, of course, where you have sufficient titer of virus, uh, sure. then you can actually get by with small volumes. Yeah. Low titer, you have the probable, uh, yeah. probabilistic uh, issue of the volumes too small, so on average, you won't have the target there, even if the individual is infected. Right. I, I just heard at the Harvard Virology Retreat a talk about uh, a guy at MIT who's developing microfluidic assays for dengue. It's amazing. And you, they, they make these patterns, which you can read on a cell phone. I think they're called QR, um, QR, right? Mm -hmm. And when the reaction is positive, it fills in the QR in a way, and you can read it on your cell phone, and it gets transmitted without having to write it down. So yep. we're going to get this guy on to it. He's amazing, yeah, great. the stuff he's doing. All right, one more email is from Thomas. First off, I can't tell you how awesome it is to have the Twix series. In addition to the witty banter, the shows do a great job of breaking down the normally jargon-laden content in a lively and accessible way. While I'm literate in basic biology, ease of information uptake through simplicity works wonders. Since I'm relatively late on the bandwagon of awesome, I've been steadily working through <laughs> the archives of TWIV. No complaints so far. This is the kind of content that works so well for shifting education paradigms. Free access unassuming style and further reading standards, links, seem to me at least to make a well-designed tool for the classroom. To what extent have you considered integrating the series with your classroom experience and vice versa? Would you be open to the idea of building an episode or two from the ground up, a sort of science on the streets interactive style? It might be really neat to have a question session with a local middle school, high school classroom to talk about some common misconceptions and otherwise intriguing experiments. So actually, we have done one of those. Right. We went to a high school and did that, but we should do it some mm -hmm. more. We should do it in a Florida high school. Sure. When it's warm. Yeah, Hawaii. sometime yeah. February. We should do Hawaii. Right? So, Hawaii? We should do Hawaii, yeah. Well, that'll cost money. <laughs> as far as integrating it with the classroom, so I use it in my course. I assign students to read certain pod, to listen to certain podcasts, and, and in fact, for extra credit, they send in a question and uh, so I integrate it that way. And others have written in in the past saying how they use this. So I think we're still in early days, but uh, I agree that it's a good component of a course. Actually, we have a current topics in microbiology thing for the current topics in virology, small group discussion for the medical students. And I draw all the material from that from TWIV. Wonderful. All right, then finally Thomas says, have you seen this paper on the origin of the Haitian cholera outbreak? And so this was what we used. We, did, we covered this story on the last episode of TWIM, This Week in Microbiology. And it was Thomas who alerted us to that story. And, and Mark, you, you know this story, right? The origin of this cholera strain from Nepal. So they had to sequence the entire genomes. And it's been done for polio for years, right? right. It's much easier. I thought of that when we went over that paper. All right, thanks all of you for your emails. That brings us to our final part of TWIVS, our picks of the week, and Rich. Okay, I um, <laughs> changed my pick at the last meeting because of a talk this morning. And my pick is a paper that appeared in the British Medical Journal in 2003 uh, by the authors uh, GCS Smith and J.P. Pell called Parachute use to prevent death and major trauma related to gravitational challenge, a systematic <laughs> review of randomized controlled trials. And this is an amazing paper. Um, let me just read you, because you can get it from this. The, uh, in the abstract, the objectives were to determine whether parachutes are effective in preventing major trauma related to gravitational challenge. 
gravitational challenge is jumping out of an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> um, the design was a, semistic, a systematic review of randomized control trials. Um, the main outcome measure was major death, major, death or major trauma as defined as an injur, injury severity score of greater than 15. Results, we were unable to identify any randomized control trials of parachute intervention. <laughs> and the conclusion is that as with many interventions intended to prevent ill health, the effectiveness of parachutes has not been subjected to rigorous evaluation using randomized controlled trials. Advocates of evidence-based medicine have criticized the adoption of interventions evaluated by using only observational data. We think that everyone might benefit if, if the most radical protagonists of evidence-based medicine organized and participated in a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled crossover trial of the parachute. Okay? <laughs> this, came up, this came up in a discussion, uh, uh, a talk this morning, about um, the use of a test that identifies individuals who are at um, or more or less likely to benefit from uh, the standard uh, ribavirin interferon therapy for hepatitis C virus. And they've identified a genetic uh, trait that they can discriminate who, uh, who is more or less likely to do this. And they've identified a test for using it. And the person who is uh, doing this has come under criticism for using this test when it hasn't been subjected to a double-blind trial. And so he brought up this paper saying, you know, sometimes, dude, it's just obvious. Okay? And in the end, actually, I got to read you. The, I'm really, the British Medical Journal, I think it's great that they published this. In the footnotes, they say, you know, and this, this is the area where they talk about authors' contributions. GCSS had the original idea. JPP tried to talk him out of it. <laughs> JPP did the first literature search, but GCSS lost it. GCSS drafted the manuscript, but JPP deleted all the best jokes. GCSS is the guarantor, and JPP says it serves him right. <laughs> so I think this is a good paper. Good to have a sense of humor, too. Yeah. The British Medical Journal, yeah. right? Great. That's great. We have to thank the speaker this morning, whose name uh, I don't remember. Uh, Matt yes. Livermore, the second, second speaker. speaker. Greenberg. I can't mm -hmm. remember. I'll find it. We'll find it and put it in the show notes. OK, my pick is related to contagion. Last week, contagion was my pick of the week. This, this week, we have two New York Times articles about the movie. One is an op-ed piece by Ian Lipkin, who was the script consultant for the movie. It's called The Real Threat of Contagion. And he's basically calling for more science to try and avert these potential threats. So have a look at that. The second is a review of the movie by Abigail Zuger, MD. And it's called The Cough That Launched a Hit Movie. And she basically says, it's a nice movie, but this isn't the way it's going to work uh, in the real world. So <laughs> check those both out after or before you've, you've looked at the movie. And finally, we have a listener pick of the week. This is from Michael of Infection Landscapes, the blog, via Twitter. Here's a very interesting microbe ad for Contagion, perhaps a pick of the week for TWIV. This is a very interesting ad that was made up in Toronto. It's basically, this is a YouTube movie showing how this was made. They made a very large Petri dish about the size of this desktop. They filled it with agar, and they painted bacteria and fungi on it to make the words Contagion. And then they put it in a storefront <laughs> at room temperature, and over a week or two, it grew out. So the, the letters were painted with serratia marcescens, so they were red, and then the fungi was around it. So you see a time lapse of this growing. It's really neat. It's a That's great cool. idea. So art and biology combined. OK, so that will do it. If you do like TWIV, you might like our other offerings this week in microbiology, and this week in parasitism. You can find them all on iTunes at the Zoom Marketplace or at microbeworld.org. We also have an app uh, produced by ASM. It's at microbeworld.org slash app. And you can stream the episodes to your iPhone, iPad, or Android device. You can also go over to twiv.tv, where we keep all of our show notes and letters 
to us. And of course, as always, send us your questions and comments. You can see we love them. Send them to twiv at twiv.tv. Trina Suderos, thank you for joining us Thank today. you so much. It was Hope great. you enjoyed it. Yeah, absolutely. The Chicago Tribune, keep on writing. Thank you. I will, hopefully. Mark <laughs> Kalanch, now the head of all viruses at the CDC. Well, not quite, right away. <laughs> but thank you for joining us as well. Looking forward to your talk on Monday. Well, it was a pleasure to be here. And finally, Rich Condit, you have to be here all the time, but I thank you anyway. Uh, I've, my pleasure as always. By the way, the speaker with the parachute paper was David Goldstein. Thank you very much. Right. That's why I have you around right. to look up this stuff. I'm not as quick as Alan, but I can do it. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and I'm at virology.ws. I want to thank also Ray Ortega. Is that camera one or two? Camera one. Andrea on camera two. Chris Condian, who would like to be on a TriCaster, but is not. He's been switching for us today, and less doing the audio boards. Thank you very much. Also, Barbara Hyde, the communication director of ASM, and Jim in the back fielding the Twitter questions. No more Twitter questions, right? Just one. <laughs> You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>